full name is Dorothy Lee, how lovely. Louisa Crossley. Victor Emmanuel, named after the King of Italy. But I never found out why. We lived in a little cottage, two bedrooms, or most people did. Two bedrooms upstairs and two rooms downstairs outside toilets. Nobody had bathrooms. The ladies did their ironing. They had what they called a flat iron. And it was a contraption where you had the iron and it had a metal plate. You took the metal plate out, you put it in the fire, then you put the metal plate back in the iron. Sometimes the women would put the iron outside if it was too hot. They would put it on the pavement outside the door to cool off a bit. Well, my earliest memory is of picking one of those irons up. I must have screamed the neighbourhood down. Everybody came out. And I remember them put, putting goose fat on it. Um, I left a bright red mark for a long time. So that was before I went to school. I don't remember that. I went to school at four years of age and we had a very strict teacher. She was very, very good. She was called Miss Whip. But we learned so much from that school. And then we had the local um, aristocrats, um, Mr. and Mrs. Taylor. He was a builder. He owned half the village. His wife was from Brazil. On the old, and I, we can never understand that the, the teachers called her the Brazil nut, which we, we, we didn't know. But she was blonde, dyed blonde. She had numerous fur coats. And every year she'd come into the classroom and there'd be great excitement. Mr. and Mrs. Taylor were coming because they came with a purse full of new pennies for that particular year. So she, they, we weren't really interested in what they were saying to us. We were waiting for the pennies being dished out. So each child got a new penny. And I remember running home to my mum. And uh, my mother needed the penny. So I gave my mother the penny. She, she really needed it. She, she worked hard in my mum. There, were, um, there was my brother, Stanley, myself, and then there was Ernest, my younger brother. When Ernest was born, my dad was out of work. My mother couldn't really afford to keep Stanley, so he was sent to his grandmother in Blackburn. So I never really saw him that much. But sometimes Stanley would come over on his bicycle. He'd, bas he'd, he'd get on his bike and ride for two hours to come and see his mum and me and Ernest. Well, when they lived in the two up, two down, and we had the old marketplace. There's an open market, you used to get a stall, all the same people every week, the biscuit man. Ernest and I used to go down for the biscuit. Uh, we used to love going there, and, and especially at night, because they all had lamps lit, you know, lanterns. And then the next morning, it used to be a bit of a mess there. And old Charlie Bottle used to come. Charlie was a bit simple, but nobody ever bothered about Charlie. He was a simple soul, it was a great. Charlie had come down with his big brush and he had no teeth and he had a big grin on his face and he'd, all he did was ever, he ever not, not, not that you like that all the time. And this brush was about wide, you know, and he'd be sweeping up. And he'd, I've never seen happier soul with a big smile on his face. Charlie in the marketplace and Teapot, there used to be Teapot. Teapot was homeless. He didn't have to be. His sister offered to take him in, but he's one of these gypsy types. He wanted to live on the road. So Teapot used to sit at our windowsill at the shop. It was a wide windowsill. He used to sit there begging for a fag, or enough money for a cup of tea. And of course, next door was the cafe. So she came in when one day did Mrs. Reagan. She said, I don't know about it, I'm getting fed up of teapot sitting on the windowsill begging because it puts people off looking in the window when you've got somebody there, it's always asking for money. And we told teapot that he could have a cup of tea every day for free if he didn't sit on the windowsill. And he could also have a bite to eat because he was always hungry, you know, he never enough food. 
So every day he got himself two cups of tea, something to eat, and, and they had his own mug. And they actually wrote his name on it, Teapot. So he'd sit there proud with his teapot and with his name on it and not knowing what was behind the system. <laughs> so we sorted that one out. And then you get the men of the road and they'd come round and they'd ask if you'd any jobs or anything and they'd say no and they'd say, well, have you got a bite to eat, ma'am? And my mum always used, mum never refused and she'd say, yeah. Uh, and they'd go in, the, if she was in the cellar, they'd sit on the steps, they, they wouldn't go in the house, they never wanted to go in the house. They'd sit there and outside and she'd make them a thick sandwich, make them a cup of tea, or a mug of tea, and then off they'd go. And it used to be, not too often, but they'd always make for, for Mum's house. And uh, the lady across the road, Mrs. Hall, uh, she said to her one day, she said, you know, it's, it's funny really, uh, uh, when they come, the men, they always like knock on my door and Mrs. Hall smiles, she said, well, they will. She said, why? She says, there's a mark on your posts at the bottom of the railings. And she said, uh, she said yeah, I watched them. She said they put a little scratch on, a little cross. For the next man of the road comes, the first thing he sees is, is looking for a scratch, he's looking for a mark. He sees it on your doorpost, he doesn't have to go anywhere else because you're going to give him a sandwich and a cup of tea. <laughs> um, Mr Ashton owned a paper in Haywood and he owned one, a small one in Manchester and he wanted to start one in Littleborough. So he asked my dad if he would be interested in editing the paper, collecting the advertisements, um, going to the theatre, doing the critics on that. So my dad was well pleased because he was really interested in that. So I ended up at nine years of age going to the theatre every Monday night with my father. It was so funny and I used to laugh and they used to point me out in the theatre, he'd say, that child's helping us, you know, because I'd, I'd start off giggling and the whole place would be roaring with laughter. They were even thinking about giving me a wage at one time. <laughs> anyway, that, you know, that, that was great then from nine till twelve, things were, you know, pretty much the same. I saw my brother once or twice. Um, I helped my mum when I could, we were good at that. My mum had no, there was no money at all and she did cleaning during the day and then during the night she sat knitting the shawl it was like gossamer like a white gossamer and it was absolutely beautiful you could if you could draw it through a ring and she'd finished and she got five shillings for making that um, and a free jug of milk from the clinic they, they um, they said that she could have a free jug of milk every week, you know, as part, pay, part payment. I remember going one day for the jug of milk and coming home, I tripped and fell. And the jug of milk went and I was broke. And... Uh, I didn't know how I was going to tell my mum. Anyway, I got her home and uh, I told her about the milk. And she said not to worry, that she had a shilling left and would be all right. So I went to school that right day, I got back home and my mum was stood at the door when I went in and she, she'd been crying. And I, I said, I asked her what was the matter and she'd lost the shilling. She'd lost the shilling. So we waited until Ernest came home. So we got organised and we were looking for this shilling and then um, we had a cellar 
um, the, you went downstairs to the salon, the door's at the top of the stairs. So I kind of pushed the door back and looked down the cellar steps. We couldn't see anything down there. So I went, I went to the top of the steps to have a look and pulled the door a bit behind me and there the shilling was at the back of the door. And you won't believe how happy she was about the shilling. And I felt better. I'd found the shilling because I'd broken the jug. Life, it was just like that. It was hand me down clothes, wait for the rag and bone man to come round. Uh, you could buy something off him, or sometimes if you gave him something, he'd give you a balloon. If you had anything to spare, you could give him. You got, you get a balloon. That was, the, that was, really some day when you got the balloon. And then the war came, and I was twelve, and that was most horrendous winter I think we ever had. Anyway, we go to we went to school when we could. We struggled through the drifts. Um, then one day Mum and I were out going for a walk near the recreation ground. There are houses there now, through the through the fields. And we heard this most awful sound like it that was like the wailing thousands of people wailing. It was awful. I remember I was absolutely terrified. And we discovered when we got back that they were trying the new system out for the warn early warnings for the, you know, the planes coming over. And it was absolutely horrendous. We got used to it though, you know. And sometimes we'd be playing out and, and the siren would go. And then we'd all stand and listen. And we wait, and everybody, all the mothers are shouting us in. But we wanted to know if they were the ankle bombers, because they had a break in the engine. You could tell it went up and down like this, you know. And they were usually the ankles that came over. So then we'd have to go inside, and we had a cellar, so we'd go down the cellar. Mum had tins of fruit and bottles of water and stuff down there, so we'd stay in there till the. Um, Till the raid was over, and one night we, Ernest and I escaped from the cellar. We were always in trouble. Mum had gone upstairs to make a cup of tea, and our the cellar opened at the bottom. There were doors at the bottom. I said, "Come on, let's go have a look. What's happening?" So we ran out. We ran out onto the bridge, and Manchester was aflame. It was we could see it all. The whole of Manchester was burning. And the bombs were dropping. My mother come ch charging after us and we got a good hiding for going out the, the thing. And uh, she wasn't, you know, she knew that we were, all, in a sense, all right, we were far enough away. But if those bombers had any loads left as they were coming back, they would drop them indiscriminately all the way back. They didn't have to take them back to Germany, they would just drop them anywhere. And of course, we lived near a big lake and they used the lake as a, as a sign. If it was a moonlight night, you couldn't cover the, the lake up, it shone, and they knew exactly where they were. And they go there to Manchester and Liverpool and just decimate the place. And it was it's strange really because it was all excitement for us. There was never any fear of danger. We never. We never thought we were in danger. We'd go to school with our gas masks and we thought it was a joke. And, our, you know, there'd be boys killed when I got to 15 years of age. Our friends would start being killed, the boys. There's quite a few of, of the local lads killed. And they used to see them coming around with the telegrams. And then one day we got one. I was 15, and a telegram came, and my mum couldn't open it, so I opened it for her. She had to let my father know, he was working in Blackpool on munitions at the time. And she sent me to Blackburn on the bus, to my grandmother's, because, as I said, my brother was brought up with my grandmother. And I had the job of going over there and telling my grandmother 
that Stanley had been killed. Um, my auntie lived there as well, so it, she wasn't on her own. She wasn't left on her own. And they wanted me to stay. I said, no, my mum needs me. I'm going home. And I remember, remember getting on the bus and crying all the way home. He was a pilot and um, they were testing some night flying equipment. Stanley volunteered to go up and he went up on his own. And what had happened was he'd gone into the dive and they couldn't get out of it. And so he blacked out while he was coming down. And, you know, so um, that was why we couldn't even see him. It, it changed, it changed so, it's changed so much. And um, then what, I'd be 15. And then three of my friends got killed. Um, I suppose in a sense, you know, we, we didn't even, I know it affected me more than the other girls because it was my brother, but there was a whole gang of us and we used to think, we have a whale of a time. We used to go dancing every week. We'd have one week, it would be the Air Force home on leave. The second might be the army, there'd be the Marines coming home, there'd be the ordinary sailors coming home. We had the Americans there. Americans were based right across from our house. There was a huge mill. And one day all these tanks and things arrived and they said the Americans are here. And um, there was one, one lad amongst those Americans that was black. Nobody had ever seen a black person before. Well, he was the talk of the village. And mum said to me, you know, you, should, you haven't to speak to him or anything like that. They don't speak to white girls. I said, all right. And the white Americans won't like you speaking to the black one. All right. Okay, okay, okay. So I'm walking down the street and he's coming up the street and I say, ah, hello, you know, and he says hello. And he promised he'd bring me an orange. So I met him at the night and he brought me this orange. And somebody told me, mother, she'd see me meeting this black man outside the chemist shop. And she said, what were you doing? I said, he brought me an orange, mother, he brought me an orange. Well, you don't take anything else, you know, you're not, it, that you're going to get into trouble. I said, no, I'm not. I'm, no, I'm not. He, he's a very nice boy. He brought me an orange. So the, the week after, he brought me some chocolate. <laughs> the whole village was talking about this chocolate and stuff. And the, the, he was a really nice lad. I, I was the only person that befriended him in that village. And I talked to and I didn't care. I didn't care what people said. I think probably about 17, 18, I got a bit cocky. I was into cigarettes for a while. And then one night we went to the pub and um, he said, uh, aren't you, what are you having to drink? And I got really brave, you know, and I think I had something like gin or something like that. Went straight to my head because I didn't drink at all. And we came out of the pub at the pub, there's a, uh, in front of the pub was a deep canal. It was used for barges. So somebody must have said to me, I bet you can't walk over that lock. Now bear in mind, this wood was about eight inches wide. And there was a huge drop on each side. And apparently I climbed on the thing. I went dancing over the lock on this eight inch plank and knew nothing about it till the next day and the girls told me what I'd done and that was the last drink I ever had. I had a rather good time really. I had lots of boyfriends and friends from school and yeah we had a great time. I have to say it was an innocent time because we you know we were so scared of, of anything happening to us you know you Oh my God, if anybody got pregnant or anything like that. Oh no, 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 no. You'd be banned for life. You'd never, uh, you know, you'd never go back to the village again. So that wasn't occurring. And I never knew anybody that, you know, got into any sort of a problem. But we had, we had a good time in as much as there was plenty, we had plenty of partners that the dances with, with plenty of boyfriends. We'd go walking up at the lake with the groups of us, we'd have parties. Although there was so much horror with it, um, 
we were never scared. We carried on as, as life was the same. It didn't make any difference to us. I never sorted out that, even with my mother. Um, she'd lost Stanley, and yet she never mentioned him after. It's like he'd gone and that was it. So, what am I now, 1920? I met a sailor. Um, got married, because everybody got married young, you know, for some reason then. And um, didn't like married life at all. I really wasn't. It was, to me, it was just boring, and he was a very possessive fella. And I'd always had plenty of friends, and you know, and they couldn't go out the same. And I was very fortunate in the sense that he got a kid into trouble. She was underage, she was 16, she was pregnant. He was the father. Uh, he got a letter from the girl's dad to say that if he didn't marry the girl, that he was going to call the police and have him arrested because the girl was underage. And uh, I was rubbing my hands, really. I should have been heartbroken, but I wasn't. So um, we went to court. I got my divorce. Uh, the judge offered me money, said I have to take some money from him, you know, um, that he could keep me. I said, I don't want him to keep me. I don't want him. I don't want his money. I, so he said, well, you have to have something. So he gave me a shilling a year. That was my allowance, one shilling. I said, oh, I'll take that. I never saw him again years after. My sister-in-law, Pat, told me that he'd gone to live near her near her house and with it along with his his wife i never asked and I, I wasn't interested i said but what did did she have a boy or a girl she said who i said dennis's wife she said she didn't have a child she said oh no she wasn't pregnant he got me married her and then she told him she wasn't pregnant and of course the father believed her Nobody ever queried anything like that in those days. If the girl said she was pregnant, she was pregnant. It did me a great favour. Because then I married Frank and I had four wonderful kids. We were married in 54, Jane was born in 55. So that's when we got the, um, the television. I was in charge. We had two sh there were two shops. Shark and Sharks. There was the big main one and then there was a small shop that Frank and I worked in. He was the manager of that. So they decided that some of the boys that worked on the television side at the, the main shop, three of them, and Frank himself would have to go out and start putting the aerials up and putting the television sets in. That left me in charge of the shop. That's also meant me uh, spending Tuesdays going down into Manchester with the girl from the other branch, Irene. We had to go into Manchester, order what we thought were going to be best sellers. We had to be very careful. We buy stacks of records and we had to carry them back, I'll, I'll come back on the train. We got back this day and Irene said, this record was called 12th Street Rag. And um, it was a, ra a razzm ragtime thing. And it was really, really good. I, I, I thought it was marvellous. And we're coming back on the train and I said, I'm going to get into trouble with Mrs. Shorrock. She said, she's not going to be happy with 25 of these, you know, 12 Street Rag. So we did some swaps on the train and I came home with the, <laughs> back with the 50 12 Street Rag. <laughs> so... So we came in and he said, what have you got this time? I said, well, I've got this. It's going to be really popular, I said. We, we have the word down at the depot. It's going to be, well, it's going to be so, I don't know, you, I don't know on earth, you, how did you manage 50 of it if it's going to be so popular? Because you know they're on the ration. Why is she giving you 50, you know? So I, I put this 12 Street rag back, bang in the middle of the window, praying. Well, 
There were two lads looking through the window and I heard them say, that, well, they've got it here. So he says, let's go and tell them. The next news, there's about 15 kids in the shop and they all want 12 Street Rye. Outside, the kids were queuing, all 50 12 Street Rags went. He says, well, you know, it's that. well, it, it became pop. It was so, did you never hear it, Rob? It was so popular. But that was part of the job. You had to know what was going to come up. And I had this, I, I had this knack of knowing where it came from, I don't know, but I hit the thing every time. So we did all right, and then we came in with the televisions, and they were out, and I mean, I had a clue. I had no idea, I'd never seen, even seen a television set. So here's me left on my own, television's at its height. People are flocking in, they've got, they've got the telly on in the window, and I got this old farmer in, and we had this most beautiful decolian. Um, it was. It was a um, walnut around front, like curve front. The doors opened, and there's a television, and that was the tops. It says, uh, can I have a look at that? And I said, yeah, yeah, of course you can they open the door. We'll put it on for me. I said, yes, yeah. so I plugged it in for me. It, it's greatly that. And I said, yeah, it's a good one, isn't it? I said, yeah, I'll have that. How much is that? Well, they were about £400, £500. So that'll be right. That's the one I want. So as Frank comes in, he's oh, I'm over the moon. I said, hey, guess what? Which I've sold that. You know, it says you haven't. I said, just paid cash. So they load it up, three of them, because it's a big thing. And they load it up and they take it out to him. Well, they come back and they were in absolute stitches. Come back with a television and and he said he wanted to give him his 500 back. I said, well, what's happened? He said, well, we get we, I, 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 more, don't we? He said, and we get the thing in. And uh, we said to him, where's your plug? And he says, what, you, what, what plug? And he says, he's on <laughs> oil lamps. He's got oil <laughs> I think the funniest time I ever had was when that television came in. There was so much going on. And the lads, uh, you know, the... The bit, what they do, they come in, and one of them have put a mic on, and they come in the shop, and I had to pretend to be selling this television to them, and they were really funny, you know, you know what lads are when they get together, and it would be hilarious. It was really great. I enjoyed those years. I enjoyed my looking at shark and shark, the whole thing. Frank and I started going out together. We used to go to the theatre a lot then. Um, this is before we were married. We used to go kind of on a weekly basis to Shaw Theatre. That that was great. We used to see some good stuff on there. And uh, so when we got married, there was already a house to go into. That was at Milner Road, as at Rochdale. And um, we still continued working at Shorrocks until I became pregnant with Jane and she was born in a snowstorm in May would you believe. Frank continued working for Shorrocks and then they were they wanted to move him they wanted him to go to this sort of shop and he wouldn't do he said no he wasn't he wasn't going to do it he wasn't about to start again and take a reduction in wage and I was pregnant and that so he um I had a friend in Littleborough that was selling the news agency. Well, he's a friend of my father's, and my father said, well, you know, they're retiring. I wonder if you'd be interested in that. So then we, um, we took the shop and we went living over the premises. We were new to the job. We started at five in the morning, and uh, we were delivering. It was a good shop. We were delivering a lot of papers, but apart from that, we had all the local mills working. They used to do shift work. So they were coming to Littleborough for the 62 shift. They'd come in from all around the area. They'd flock into Littleborough. It was busy all day. And um, and then I became pregnant with Tim. How old would Jane be then? She'd be nine, eight, nine. She'd be 50 this time. It's 42. She'd be eight. And, um, so she kind of was helping a bit in the shop. 
and then quickly had Sally. There's only 14 months between those two, I think. Things really, they couldn't improve. There was no way they could improve because then when we had the shop, it was doing very, very well. Um, we had an excellent trade and he was gambling it all away. Um, so that wasn't helping. And then when, um, fortunately, when Kerry arrived, he had a big win on the horses and it was enough to put a deposit. I think, I think we paid about 500 deposit on Victoria Street. And then we, we borrowed the rest from the council. So, you know, the kids grew up. Uh, jobs weren't very good then. Tim got a job in a mill, uh, inside job. And his dad said, oh, you know, he'd, he'd do well there. And I, he hated it. He hated every minute of it. So then he got this job working abroad. And Frank just put his foot, no, you're not going. He said, you got the decent job. And, you're not going. I said, hang on a minute. I said, I've got to say in this. I said, did you like working in the brickyard? I said, when your father died and you had to have a job, you went to work in your mother's shoes because you hadn't got any. I said, you worked in a brickyard at Milnrow for how long? I said, you hated every minute of it. I said, yeah, I did. I said, well, Tim's the same. Tim hates every minute. And I don't see why he should do it. I said, you didn't want to do it, you got out. So I don't see he's got a chance to go, he goes. He's working abroad. So, oh yeah, you're right, you're quite right. So he agreed with me and Tim got his job abroad and went. And then Sally got to university, brightest girl in the school. First words she ever spoke were on board, I think. Never enough for Sally. Kerry was in her shadow for a while. She was in Sally's shadow. Sally was the one who gave all the instructions and direction. <laughs> anyway, then Kerry, then Sally got to university, by which time Frank was ill and he couldn't go up when she got her um, a degree. So Bill and I went up for that degree day and uh, we had a great day. Good, smashing. And then um, Kerry went away and she started learning about things, I think, after Sally left because she kind of took herself over then and, and bounded away. You know, she, uh, she was climbing too. She was on the up. They were so different, those girls. Kerry was a very caring, compassionate little girl. I mean, from being, she looked after Claire all those years when she was ill. She used to shop for her, they used to go shopping together. She was like a, a second mum to Kerry, you know, she really looked after her. <laughs> Tim was a laid back lad. He was a smiler, he was. It's Sam, Sam, Sam all over again. I know I'm going back again, but you do in life, you know, you, you remember things and you remember the happier times, I think. And your mum used to say, is that the coal man? I'd say, yeah. Right. And all the kids were alerted to this because he'd be going up the hill and the horses would be, the big shy horses, he'd be sat in the front. The coal bags were behind. Well, if it went over a bump, it used to shake some coal out. All the kids ran out, were filling the pockets. <laughs> We had time for shovels, <laughs> and then um, when it got, they used to have, they used to get a shovel in the, the horse muck. You could sell the horse muck, you know, to the yeah, to the people who had the allotments. The milkman, he came with a horse and cart. They had the churns on the back, and he used to come out with your jug and it was measuring jug. He knew he knew how much milk was. He could tell the size of the jug, he knew immediately how much it would hold, he knew how much it was going to cost. The lads used to go, and the cows would be in the field, and the, if, the, if the kid, the lad, oh, was, oh my God, no. The lads would run up to the cow and take some milk off her. They were thirsty, yeah. I'd see them do that. 
We used to like used to go walk every Sunday. Me and my mum, Sadie, Dad, and he used to say, you know, he used to say to him, you just look like Princess Margaret and Princess Elizabeth would have these navy blue coats on her because our best, we could only wear them once a week. And so we'd go, we'd dress. And he used to give us this spiel about how we look like two princesses walking up the road, you know. And then we come across my brother, Ernest, with his little gang, just like Alfalfa and his gang. Scruffy, dirty, socks down, and we'd be trotting along, or going to the lake, and my father would spy them in the distance. And they'd all be running around, and Ernest would see my dad coming along with my mother and I. And we go straight past, not a word spoken. You know why? Dad used to say, if we're ever walking up Elise and you see us, you don't speak to us. And we're not speaking to you. Because he was dirty and scruffy and he wouldn't go for a walk with us. So my dad didn't want to know him. So he got his instruction. We were the two princesses <laughs> with the queen and the king. I used to, the only subject I was any good at school was English, literature. I was always way at the top. Mr. Cunliffe was very proud of me. I got my interest definitely in writing and books from my father, definitely. It was really into history, I loved history. Yeah, I was, I was pretty close to my dad. It's, you know, when he was in the war and um, he used to tell me those stories that I, I think sometimes should be written down, you know. And one time he said they were in the trenches and um, there was a sniper uh, and he, he killed, you know, quite a few of the lads because they couldn't get out of where they were and every time they made a move the shot would fire over. My dad volunteered to do it. And when he got to it, he, he told one of the lads to move his heart. The lad moved his heart. The sniper fired. My dad saw where he came from and my dad shot him. Um, he, I can't conceive of somebody looking around and not seeing, you know, what there is to see, what's there, you know, where did it come from and all you need to look at the night sky. Um, no, I, I'm very strong. Uh, spiritual beliefs, definitely. Oh, where do I start with the strange things? My mother had it. She, um, she used to th see things and people. Um, when she knew my, my dad before they were married, um, his mother was an Irish lady and um, she had a boarding house in Blackburn where they were, where they were born, where the lads were born. My mum said the place was an absolute tip. Her house was really not well kept and, you know, everything was, was a mess in the place. But she used to board the people from, they were coming in for the shows that week and... Um, it was an old place, it was an old house. And she had people like Laurel and Hardy and Wallace Beery and musical star stayed there and mum met some of them. And uh, so the first time mum ever saw anything, she was at the house and there was a long stone passage. And she saw this old lady going down and she was, she was dressed about what? maybe 18 something. She had a like a, a black busley dress on and this grey hair and it looked a bit wild. And um, so she thought it was one of the characters who was staying there, you know. She said, well, who's the old lady that's staying here? She said, which, which old lady? She said, you know, the one who's down the corridor, she said. No, 
oh no, no, I just stayed in the corridor. She says, we haven't got anybody. Oh, lady stayed in here. So my mum described her. No, oh, no, she didn't know. So my mother forgot about it, didn't bother. So these things happened throughout her life. So she was telling me these stories. And I, I was, I really believed her because she, she would never make anything of my mum. She wasn't like that. She was really truthful about the stuff. And then I discovered over the, the years that things happened to me that I, I couldn't explain. I explained to Frankie, poo poo it, didn't believe it. Until, of course, it happened to him as well. It was near Eli, anyway. We, we, we got this place to rent. And it was an old farm, anyway. We, we, we got this place to rent. And it was an old farmhouse. So um, we arrived. We were empty in the car. The kids were wandering around looking, you know, to see what was what. And um, so I said to Frank, well, I think what I'll do, I'll start washing all these pots up that we've used on the way. And if you st start bringing some of the bags in and taking them upstairs. So I said, right. So I put the water in the sink and I put the pots in. And I was starting to wash up. And I felt so sad. I just never felt anything like that. Depressed, sad. I started crying. I was really tearful. I couldn't understand it. I just wanted to get out of the house. I wanted to get away from the house. And um, so anyway, he... He came down and he said, what's the matter? I said, I don't know. I said, I just had a terrible feeling here. I said, I just want to go away. Frank said, well, look, I'll make you a cup of tea. You go and run a bath. He said, the, the kids will be okay. You go and run a bath and just have a bit of a break. And um, and I'll make you a cup of tea. So I said, right. So I started to put the water in the, in the bath. I leaned over the bath and somebody shoved me from behind. And I was really angry because, I mean, I could have slipped. I hurt myself. I said, what? Don't be... I was going to say, don't be so stupid. I think, couldn't think... Oh, it was one of the kids. So what? And I turned around, there's nobody there. So I thought, oh, well, I'm not saying anything else, you know. I'd already mentioned about the crying bit. So I came out and um, I said, are you all right? I said, well, yeah, well, yeah, but something's wrong with this play. Yeah, he said, yeah, you're right. And I said, oh, you know, <laughs> I said, you, you think there's something wrong? He said, <coughs> he said, I just made you a cup of tea. He said, and I put it on the table. He said, and it moved across the table. He says, so I didn't worry. I thought there's a bubble or what, you know, there's a bubble underneath. He says, so I just picked the pot, I just picked it up, he said. Sure enough, it's wet. So he dried it, dried the table put it down. This time it went round the table. And I said, what are we doing? Are we moving? He said, well, no, we, we, we suspect something. We'll keep kind of out of here as much as we can. I said, right. So he gets to bed. We haven't been in bed quarter of an hour before Tim comes in. He says, Mum, said what? He says, can, can I go in with the girls? I said, what for? He says, I don't like that room. He said, it's all cold, it's it's awful room. And he won't go back, he won't go in it. I said, right. So we ended up moving his bed in with the girls. He was terrified of that room, he wouldn't go near it. So I said, right. So, so the next time we saw the people who owned it, um, she said, oh, are, are you going on? I said, oh, yeah, yeah it's all right. I said, um, uh, how old is this house? She said, oh, it's, it's very, 16 something, you know. She, she said, oh. Well, well, why were you asking? I said, well, no, I just got a strange feeling. You know, I didn't say, I just got a strange feeling in that old part of the house. Oh, yes, yeah, she said, oh, yes, she said. Uh, so did we, she said. Uh, we built the new part, she said, but we left it. We built the new house down the road. They couldn't live in it. And then we had our own ghost at Victoria Street. I've been fortunate. Got the kids I have, but uh, looking back, you know, I don't think I would have changed anything because I wouldn't, I wouldn't be have what I have today. And then of course I met Bill, who I'd known, I'd known Bill for a long time, 
So that was another very happy episode. Yeah, the most important thing is my family. Mm -hmm.